it is a huge, 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 huge honor to be interviewed today. Mike, the man, Barr, Michael Barr, the dental warrior, uh, who has the legendary 32,000 posts on Dental Town. Big fan of your blog. Big fan of everything you do. Uh, you crush it on all things social media. Uh, in fact, you were one of the originals um, of kind of social media because your first big breakout and, and helping my practice was your uh, book, Rev Up My Marketing, about uh, website marketing. And uh, you sold a gazillion of those books. So uh, first of all, um, and and uh, and you, you have a uh, distinguished personality. I know you're all things uh, anti-big government. You're a staunch <laughs> defender of the NRAs. Uh, um, the right to own arm, bear arms and all that stuff. But uh, I just want to start off with, uh, man, thanks for giving me an hour of your time, Mike. Oh, are you kidding me? Uh, anytime. Uh, this is my first uh, real Skype, so you know, be gentle with me, will you? Yeah, Microsoft bought this for like $8.9 billion, and uh, it works pretty good a lot of the times. I, I, I think its failures aren't with uh, Skype. I think it's your internet connection. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you'll be doing one of these Skypes, and someone you're Skyping the... Uh, the internet breaks off or whatever. Uh, right. so, but uh, so, so first of all, um, thanks for joining me. And, and, and probably everyone's wants to know, how did you come up with the name Dental Warrior? Why are you a dental warrior? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't even recall how I came up with it. I think I was just brainstorming for a, a domain name for my, uh, uh, for my uh, blog. And uh, I just wanted a place where I could uh, write whatever the heck I wanted and not have to worry about... Uh, uh, you know, who I might uh, offend or bother and no censorship, no moderators, uh, none of that. And uh, it was a place for me to kind of archive, uh, you know, my ramblings, basically. And uh, so uh, I was trying to come up with a name and uh, somehow Dental Warrior, I think mainly it was available. Uh, the Dental Warrior, the com was available. So that's what I took. And so that's how they can read your blogs, the Dental Warrior.com. How many, how many blogs do you have on the thing? You must have a hundred on there. Oh, I think I've written, I think I'm at almost 300 articles. 300? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and how many of them would you say, and what percent of them are on dental related? Because some, uh, some of them are you know, other things, government or NRA or? Uh, it's a kind of an eclectic uh, set of topics. I, I write about, you know, dentistry, marketing uh, in dentistry, website marketing. I, uh, I write a little bit about guns, which is one of my other passions. And so it's kind of an, an oddball uh uh, you know, uh, association between those two subjects. So it's about guns and dentistry. So, uh, it, and, it, your, and your son playing you know, hockey. What's that? And your son playing hockey. Uh, you know, I haven't written about that actually. Not on, not on my blog. I write about that on uh, Facebook a fair bit, but, uh, so, uh, and, yeah, and, but, and we're, and we're talking when you're, when you're hearing this podcast, I'm, I'm going to throw Mike under a bridge right now because I'm going to pin him down to this is the night before game one of the Stanley cup, which is tomorrow. And right. you're from Florida. And, of and yeah. Tampa Bay is in this with right. the New York Rangers. Uh, or, no, no. Or, Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, I'm sorry. Chicago Blackhawks. So, right. so who's, so who's going to win game one? Lightning. Tampa Bay <laughs> lightning. Yeah. 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 I, I think, uh, I, I would like to see Florida, a Florida team win a hockey Stanley cup. How cool would that be? And will there be, um, should we look for alligators on the ice hockey rink? <laughs> in, in Florida, yeah. it seems like the alligators show up everywhere. I, I was reading the other day on the news that uh, it caused a massive car wreck. A car actually hit an alligator and knocked him over in the other lane and hit a semi truck. Yeah, you, you don't want to hit an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's your first talking point. Do not hit an alligator. But that's hey, right. so, so Mike, I want to I want to start off with this first question. Um, uh, last Thursday, I just went to the uh, graduation. Uh, class of uh, AT Steel. They just graduated around the dentist. So this is graduation time. So about 5,000 kids are going to graduate from dentistry. You and I are both old dogs that have been doing this for three decades. So we're in our 50s. Um, what advice would you give to the dental graduates? Because these, 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 these kids are coming out with $250,000 of student loans. Um, there's corporate dentistry. There, you know, it, it's a changing environment. Um, also, Mike, they, they come out of school $250,000, and if they believe everything they read on the, uh, the Internet, um, they need to buy a CAD CAM machine for another one hundred and fifty, dollars and a CBCT for another one hundred and fifty, dollars and maybe some, uh, you know, so, so should they, you know, so, so what advice do you give them? If your son, who's only, what is, how old is your son, 12? 14 today. 
14 today. Tell him I said happy birthday. Well, um, <laughs> if he was not 14, but he was 24, which is yeah. how old I was when I graduated from dental school, what advice would you give your own son coming out of school today? Uh, well, I guess it's too late if he's graduating from dental school, right? <laughs> it's too late. Too late to tell him to turn back. No, what? I'm kidding. Okay, uh, okay. Well, well yeah. that, that's a great, that's even a greater question. Are you going to tell your son that dentistry would be good? Follow dad's? Because your wife's a lawyer, correct? No, no, she was. Uh, she's a uh, uh, stay-at-home mom for now, but she was an investment analyst. Well, would you would you tell your son to be an investment analyst or a dentist? Definitely an investment analyst. <laughs> okay. I think so. Well, you know. Well, well, let me phrase it like this. What would you tell your son if he said, Dad, I want to grow up and be a dentist just like you? Yeah, well, then I would definitely encourage it. Uh, you know, I think you should do what you want to do. Uh, you know, if you're if you're compelled to become a dentist, I mean, I, I love dentistry, I really do. Uh, but you and I have been at it longer than than I care to admit, anyways. And we've seen a lot of changes. It's I think it's a it's a much tougher environment. They're coming out, like you said. I think two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt is low. I think it's probably, uh, from what I've heard, three hundred and up from the local private schools here. I know of, of dental students graduating uh, with five hundred thousand dollars in debt, and uh, you know that's a problem. And, and what, what, do you, what do you think is the difference between a dentist that walks out two fifty in debt and versus five hundred in debt? About two hundred fifty thousand. <laughs> well, I mean, but why, what do you think that is though? Because because some of the some I, I have to admit um, I'm I'm I got two dental schools in my backyard and and you know I I didn't own a car the first five years of college um, and I always had you know I always worked forty hours a week and I, I see these kids driving thirty thousand dollar cars and on yeah. spring break going on cruises. And yeah. going to Cabo, and and I, I just like, wow, you're living like you're already a successful dentist, and you're doing on student loan money. So some of that, some of that student loan money is crazy money. Yes, uh, it's funny that you bring that up. I have a, a local colleague who ha who hosted uh, one of the senior dental students at the local school here, uh, just as a kind of a, a shadowing day, and they started talking about that, and and the student said that many of her classmates are borrowing the max that they can borrow. And apparently, uh, you know, the institutions that are loaning this money are, are basically handing it out and they're going on trip. Uh, well, in fact, this student had been on a trip to Iceland and some of them were buying cars, like you said. And, uh, you know, it's funny that you bring this up because I've got my little uh, set of talking points here. And what would I advise to a dental student uh, or, you know, somebody graduating? Actually, I'd probably give them the same advice that the day they start dental school is to keep your debt load low low don't borrow against all of you know it's uh, i don't know how some of them are ever going to come out of five hundred thousand dollars in debt uh you know realistically and if they uh, ever hope to have a practice someday um that's an even bigger problem you know you start adding everything up you're looking at well over a million dollars just to get started um so my my advice would be to keep your debt as low as possible and uh but I think there's a different culture uh, today as far as that goes. And from what I understand, there's also a, uh, uh, you know, a loan, uh, a government sponsored go loan repayment program that effectively lowers their payments to uh, something like 10% of their monthly income or their actual payment, whichever is less. And then after 20 years, it's all forgiven. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other uh, political uh, issue that we could go on about. But I think that uh, borrowing as much as you can is a big mistake. And the same goes for when you start your practice or buy a practice. Uh, I, I will admit that I, you know, uh, I probably borrowed and spent more than I should have on, on building my office. And it was a big nut to cover for a long time. And so if you can uh, limit your debt, I think that's probably the number one thing. Okay. Okay. So advice for graduating students, limit your debt. Number two, um, when they, when, when you came out back in the day, um, you went into the Navy, uh, yeah. to get dental experience. How long did you serve in the Navy? Three years, three years. And, and, uh, did you, uh, looking, looking back, I mean, that's obviously a residency. I mean, you, they, they, they do. Did you look back and see that as a residency? I mean, did you learn more dental skills or oh, was I'm it just a lot of practice or? Yeah, it was it was actually a, a fantastic opportunity. I uh, I got a lot of continued education, not only uh, didactic but uh, even more so clinically. 
Uh, my first year I went through, uh, I was at a big dental clinic in San Diego where it was broken up into the various departments, almost like a dental school. We had a prosthodontics department, an oral surgery department, an endo department, oral surgery, uh, and so on, oral diagnosis department, operative department, and I rotated through those. And so I spent, you know, for example, three months of doing nothing but endo all day, every day, just root canals. And I had uh, the supervision of board-certified endodontists, uh, you know, to come look over my shoulder whenever I needed them. So it was almost, uh, it was like having your favorite dental school instructors and no grades. Now, was that, that, was that that 99-chair facility that, that uh, fixes up the Marine Corps down on, by Coronado Island? Uh, no, this was at uh, 32nd Street uh, called Naval Station. So it's uh, on the main, it's where the, most of the ships are. Because, um, because I noticed that in the military, <clears throat> the Army, Navy, Air Force has their own dentist, but right. the Navy dentists are in charge of the Marine Corps. Right, that's true. Yeah. The so Marine, are you working on mostly Navy or Navy and Marine? Uh, mostly Navy. Mostly, mostly Navy. Navy. Where, yeah, where I was, yes. Okay, so and what would you... I was on a ship for two years after that. So, so on advice to um, graduating dental students, would you recommend that they do a residency? Would you recommend the military? And what do you, what would you say if somebody said, "Hey, I'm going to go work for uh, one of the big corporate chains like um, Heartland or Pacific Dental Services or something uh, to to get two, three years uh, wet gloved experience in corporate dentistry? Would that be a Navy equivalent in modern day times now?" Uh, you know, it's hard. You know, it's hard for me to say because uh, uh, you know I'm not in the Navy now. And, I, you know, it's entirely possible that that has changed. But I think it's two very different things, or at least in my, in my imagination, I think it would be very different and probably would attract different personalities. Let's face it, the military isn't for everybody. Uh, there, are, there are pluses and minuses, uh, you know, to being in the military. Uh, the first, I guess, minor, uh, you know, negative would be that the government owns you. And, uh, you know, if there's a war and they want you to go, you're going. And so you have to be okay with that. And, uh, you know, I was on a ship and... Uh, you know, when I joined the Navy, my, my Jewish grandma said, what do you want to be in the military for? What if there's a war? I said, Grandma, there's not going to be a war. Everything's going to be fine. In my head, I thought, hey, if it happens, it happens. But, you know, I tried to reassure her. Uh, my ship was in the Indian Ocean when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, and my ship turned course that day. And the first thought that went through my head wasn't that, oh, crap, I'm going to war. My first thought was, oh, crap, my grandmother's going to freak out. <laughs> so, <laughs> And she did. Uh, but, yeah, my ship was the first response to the invasion of Kuwait, and we were up in the Persian Gulf for 118 days without seeing land or a female. And uh, so it was interesting. And so you've got to be okay with that. If you have a family, that may factor into it. I was single, so you know, I had no worries as far as family goes. Uh, the military, I think, is a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, they did not pay for my school. I volunteered. A lot of people assume that there was, you know, a scholarship and that, you know, that I owed the Navy uh, you know, three years, but no, uh, I actually, uh, paid for my dental school and then joined the Navy anyways. <laughs> and so, uh, and it was still worth it for me. I got to see the world. Uh, I got a lot of clinical experience. I made a lot of good friends. The social life is fantastic. And, uh, so I have no regrets and I would do it all again. Uh, as compared to corporate dentistry, I did actually work, uh, after the Navy, I went into a local corporate chain. That was my first job as an associate. Uh, and uh, I knew that it wasn't for me. I didn't. What well, was the chain? Are they still around? Uh, yeah, they're still around. It's a local chain here in Florida uh, called Dental Land. Really, and Dental Land? It's called Dental Land. Yeah, yeah. We we called it Mental Land. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so uh, and it was uh, it was a big wake up call for me. I I got used to in the Navy having basically the best of everything in terms of equipment and materials and time. You know, with patients. Uh, it was a very different uh, experience going into, uh, you know, the so-called corporate uh, type of a dental practice, large group dental practice with, you know, associates that kind of come and go. And uh, I lasted about 10 months there. And then I went, uh, I found an associateship with a private office and I spent about two years there uh, before I opened my own practice from scratch. And that was in Palm Spring, Palm, Palm Beach or? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm in my current practice is in Boynton Beach, which is in Palm Beach County. I and that, that's north of, that's uh, north of Miami, north of Fort, Fort Lauderdale, almost uh, half the way to, to Boca? Uh, no, I'm just a little bit north of Boca, actually. I'm about 15 minutes north of Boca. Okay. So I'm between Boca Raton and West Palm Beach. 
Okay. And uh, so, um, so what was it like? Um, so what advice would you say to people setting up their own practice? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I think starting from scratch, it was a very difficult way to do it. And if I was to, you know, do it all over again, I probably would try to find an existing practice to, uh, to purchase. I think that's probably a smarter thing, hit the ground running uh, to a degree. Uh, starting, I literally started from scratch with zero patients, and it was a, it was a, a long, tough ride. Um, so, uh, you know, I think probably the best thing a, uh, you know, a new, new graduate could do would be find an associateship in a private office. Uh, but I think those are, are few and far between, uh, you know, whereas the corporate jobs are, are more plentiful. Um, if they could find a private care type practice to associate in, I think that would be, uh, the best scenario. But, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do and get a job and get to work. And, and start paying the bills. Um, but I think what I've witnessed here locally, those that start in the corporate practices, uh, which are you know, largely HMO and PPO driven, uh, it, it kind of becomes the only world that they know. And so when they do start their own private practice or buy a practice and they're slow, and what do they do? They, they, st they sign up for all the plans. And of course, I know I might ruffle a few feathers uh, you know, I have my own opinions about, uh, you know, uh, managed care and participation in that, and which I don't uh, so far. <laughs> Anything can happen. But, uh, you know, I think that becomes the only thing they know. And so when they go out into their own, on their own, whether they purchase a practice uh, or start from scratch, they tend to, you know, basically fall back on the world that they know, which is, you know, managed care. And so... But there's, that, a, there's another guy in Florida... Whose name also starts with M? Who also has thirty thousand posts? Named Motti, and you oh, guys, yeah. have, you guys <laughs> have been uh, uh, sparring for uh, a decade and a half on Dental Town. Um, he he loves man. He loves HMOs yeah. and PPOs. Now, does he right. love HMOs and PPOs or just PPOs? I, you know, I think he just does PPOs. I, I think, but you know, I'm not even sure now that you mention it. Uh, but yeah, he's he's a big fan of managed care. Uh, when Dental Town first started, he and I would go at it. Uh, and we're actually good friends uh, now. And uh, I don't know if you remember the very first dental town meeting, the first townie meeting in Vegas. They had the sumo wrestling suits that you could sumo wrestle. So we had Maudie versus uh, Mike. Uh, it was the HMO or P managed care versus uh, fee for service uh, uh, sumo match. And so we, we did the sumo thing. Uh, is, is, he, is he near you? He, uh, I think he's uh, down in Margate, which is closer to Fort Lauderdale. So, well, you know what? If you can figure out, because you're a, a techie, if you can figure out how to uh, triple Skype, where all three of us can be on there, that would be an awesome debate. Mike Barr, fee for service, Madi Managed Care. They're both from Florida. They're both thirty thousand posting townies. Let's do it for an hour. Would you be up for that? Oh, I would absolutely. I don't know how much I would argue with them, though. You know, as I've gotten older. Uh, one of the, one of my philosophies is, you know, it's hard to argue with success and he's successful. So, you know, uh, it's definitely not for me. I think it's a different mindset and I respect, I have a lot of respect for, for Marty and, uh, but it's a different mindset and it's not for me and, and my head would explode if I, if I was involved in that, it really would. Uh, but he's successful. So I mean, there's no doubt it can be done successfully. I mean, so I can't say, well, that doesn't work or, you know. Uh, hey, he's he's uh, he's been successful for a long time, and I know other dentists that are very successful in that kind of an environment. Uh, and so, you know, hats off to them. Uh, but I think I think the key is you got to figure out what you want. And uh, you know, there's there's more to life than money. And uh, you know, dentistry we're one trick ponies. And so, you know, you and I both know dentists that hate what they do. There are dentists that post on Dental Town that they hate their job. They hate going into the office every day. And I think about how, how awful that must be because, uh, you know, we're kind of trapped, so to speak. If we want to do another career, we've got to start over in terms of our education. Uh, you know, uh, if you have a business degree, you can, you can leverage that into a lot of different jobs. But we're one-trick ponies, and there's not really uh, any other job that a dental degree will help you in. And so I think you know, find, find what you like to do, where you'll be happy, and do that. I, I want to... Um I want to go to your book. One of the first big breakout things you did, you, you were leading, you, you were an entrepreneur pioneer leading the way on uh, website marketing. And you wrote a book, Rev Up My Marketing. Uh, I read it and so did a gazillion other dentists and everybody I know loved it. 
talk about your book and and also talk about um, how have websites changed when you first um, started your first website versus down is, is there anything any, anything new with websites that yeah well, okay uh, that's that's a, a broad subject uh, <laughs> we could be here all night but uh, you know I started well, my well, you're, you're I mean I mean and, and when I'm saying that I mean I, I also think you is very marketing savvy so you know so website marketing I mean that, yeah. that's that's a big component of marketing Sure, I think it's probably these days the biggest component. When I started my website, I built my first website in 1999. And uh, at the time, my, my intent was for internal marketing. I thought it would be a way for, uh, uh, for me to direct my patients who may be interested in cosmetic dentistry. I could tell them, visit my website and uh, you know check it out. Check out the pictures. It was kind of a soft sell, so to speak. It was a way for me to introduce them to that, and they could do it on their own time at home. And I thought of it as internal marketing. I, I thought that nobody would look for a dentist online. That was my thought at the time. Actually, I was right at the time. Nobody was looking for a dentist online at the time. I even wrote an article for the local dental association's newsletter uh, saying, you know, do I need a website? And my conclusion was yes, but don't, don't expect anybody to try to find a new dentist online. Do it for internal marketing. And I think at the time I was probably fairly accurate, uh, but that's changed. Uh, you know, a lot of people will look for, you know, healthcare care uh, online, uh, look for a dentist online. And I think a lot of times they're looking for a specific type of dentist. They may be looking for information on implants or veneers or, or braces uh, and, and, and things like that. So, uh, but I started off with, uh, uh, I think my first website was like 10 pages long or six pages, something like that. And, uh, you know, it just has grown since then. I think I've got about 55 pages on it. And uh, a majority of my new patients come through the website. In fact, it's pretty much the only external marketing I do. Uh, I've dabbled in everything. I've, I've done everything from newspaper ads to magazine advertorials, uh, television ads, radio ads. And, you know, bang for the buck, nothing beats a website. Uh, you know, every, all the other media have time or space limits. You know, a newspaper ad only has so much space, and the bigger the space, the more it costs. Uh, a radio ad is so many seconds long, 30 seconds, 15 seconds. The more time uh, you occupy uh, in your ad, the more it costs. And then there's also the, the matter of when your, air, or when your ad airs, and that changes the cost. And the same thing with television. And so you can spend a lot of money in those areas, in, the, in those mediums, uh, and it takes a long time to see results. Uh, websites are by by comparison fairly inexpensive, and your space and time is pretty much unlimited. So, so Mike, okay, so I, I'm always trying to guess. You know, I, I the, you know, you, we got an audience of uh, you know on, on the average podcast, it's probably gonna be about you know, you know three to five thousand people are gonna listen to this over a quarter. So I'm trying to guess their questions. I'm on the treadmill right now for an hour. I'm driving to work right now. H how do I know if Mike the man bar thinks my uh? Um, is websites good? How does a dentist know if, oh. his, if her website's good? And how? What, what, what are some red flags that your website right. ain't good? And, and uh, right. yeah, signs that your website sucks. Uh, well, one, I guess the first sign would be it's not working. You know, uh, I asked the, the dentist. You know, are you getting patients from your website? And unfortunately, a lot of them uh, will either say no or they say I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I think, first of all, you, you know, every dentist should be tracking where their patients come from. So is your website working? Because like I said a little while ago, I don't argue with success. I might look at your website and think, you know, uh, subjectively that I don't like what I'm seeing. But if it's working for you and it's bringing in a gazillion patients, then who am I to argue with success? But I usually don't come across that. Uh, most dentists complain that their website's not working. And I think there are a lot of factors that, that go into that. But uh, I think probably, you know, first of all, dentists think like dentists. Uh, you know, we, uh, one of my dental school instructors said that if you ask a dentist what time it is, he's going to tell you how to build a clock. And uh, so we tend to tell our patients, not only on our websites, but even face to face in our offices, we start talking about osseo integration and hybridized dentin bonding. And we, 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 we tell them how we make the sausage. And nobody wants to know how you made the sausage. They just want to enjoy the sausage. Patients want to know if they're going to look good, feel good, last a long time, basically. How long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost? Those are the questions they have. But meanwhile, we're talking about osseo integration. And I've seen websites, dental websites, where they've got pictures, for example, on the implant page. 
of the implant surgery, actually a flap with the bone and the implant going into the bone. And I've seen, uh, you know, and a dentist asked me, what do you think? And I said, I think you need to get rid of those pictures. And he said, well, they're good pictures. I said, they're wonderful pictures for a dental textbook. But I said, people don't want to see that. They want to see smiles. They want to know, again, you know, if it's going to look good, it's going to feel good, and it's going to last a long time. Uh, sell, sell the benefits, not the, uh, you know, not the features. Uh, and uh, so I think that's a big mistake that I see on, on a lot of dental websites. Uh, I saw one that described in excruciating detail how an extraction is performed down to we break the periodontal ligaments and then we elevate the tooth. And it was, it was literally, it was a step-by-step -step how to extract the tooth. People don't want to know that. It grosses them out. And You're right. We, Every, everybody wants to go to McDonald's and just eat a cheeseburger. No one wants to see the cow get shot. Exactly. And so uh, I think that's, that's you know, a, a common mistake I see. Uh, you know, another problem is a lot of the websites out there, you know, the dentist wants to write a check and here, you know, to the XYZ company, make me a website, put it up, do all the SEO, and, and, and hopefully patients are going to start coming. And the problem with that is that most of these website companies, they can't produce custom content for every single dentist, and most of them don't because the cost would go up quite a bit. So they get template websites, it's insert dentist name here, and it's just basically a, a, a dental glossary or dental encyclopedia, and uh, this is a filling, this is a crown, this is a denture, this is a root canal, and uh, I think that's a big mistake. One of the things that I uh, have advocated for a long time on Dental Town and on my blog and in my book is that the dentist needs to be involved, or somebody in the office at least, uh, needs to be involved in creating the content of the, of the website. Uh, it needs to, to speak like they speak. It needs to resonate with the visitors as, as a real person, you know, talking to them through the website. And, you know, my website, I wrote every word on it. I took every picture. And I realize not every dentist is a writer, but I think they can throw something together and then have somebody edit it and, uh, you know, uh, uh, now, did you actually program your website? I, yeah, I do everything. You I, write I, the code, HTML? Well, I, I don't have, you know, most of the website uh, creation software kind of does that for you, or what you see is what you get. It's almost like a word processor. Uh, but occasionally I do delve into the code a little bit, but I'm not really a code writer. But, but if I, this person driving to work right now, uh, I think the majority of my listeners are on an hour commute. And you would okay. think that means across LA, but almost everyone who emails me, it's always rural. It's always, I live in a town of 5,000. I got a 70 mile commute to a town of 8,000 where my dental office is. So if the dentist bought Rev Up My Marketing and read this book, she could create her whole website? No, uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Well, first my book's out of print at the moment. I'm working on the second edition. Uh, and that's it's called uh, the, uh, the uh, Complete Website Owner's Manual for Dentists. That's that's the name of the book. Uh, Rev Up My Marketing is just the company I created to sell the book. Uh, but yeah, it's the Complete Website Owner's Manual. And that's kind of the idea. It's an owner's manual. Uh, you know, I, if you want to create the website from soup to nuts by yourself, uh, there are plenty of books about how to do that. And I've read plenty of those myself. Uh, but what I tried, tried to do with this uh, website owner's manual was educate dentists on what, it, what makes a dental website work. And what makes it, you know, what, and what doesn't work, so that they can be educated consumers when they when they they team up with a website creation company, and there are plenty of good ones out there, and a lot of them are on Dental Town, uh, very helpful. Uh, and, any any ones you like? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm partial a little bit to uh, New Patients Inc. My my buddy uh, Howie Horrocks, uh, he's actually done some work for me. Uh, his company has even on my website the little floating head videos. They did that for me. Would, you, uh, would and, you say in dentistry you can never go wrong with anyone named Howie? I mean, well, not, there you go. You know, but I, I believe that. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love him. He, he's a great guy. He's a great guy, but and even will, a, and even a better fisherman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, but he'll tell you, and a lot of his, his his clients that read my book, he loves working with them because they're educated. They understand what goes into a website to make it successful. And so they're better partners. So that was the goal of the book was to make dentists better partners with website designers. Okay. And well, my, well my, when, I, when I think of a uh, good website or when I hear people talking about a website, um, a lot of the talking about, um, you know, that if you bought a website five years ago and you haven't changed anything, Google says, 
you know, there's there's no activity. It's kind of a blackout. That that Google SEO, and and I, I'm just hearing what people say that um, you know, Google likes it to be updated. They like fresh. They like fresh content. Um, does how often do you freshen up your website? How often do you add a new picture, a new blog, and new content? It's well, you know, uh, not actually, you know, it's it's hit and miss with me. It's uh, whenever it occurs to me, really. It's not on any kind of regular basis. Uh, for me, I, I don't have a blog attached to my uh, website currently. I did have a, a separate blog, which has been rather inactive because I've been busy with so many other things. But as far as my actual website, you know, I updated it fairly recently. I added a page. Uh, and uh, so, for example, I added a page about quality dental plan, an in-house dental savings plan for my patients. And so I wanted a page about that that would be optimized for people who might be doing searches for you know, no dental insurance, a dentist where, I, you know, I don't have dental insurance. That's a real common thing. And I, you know, I'm worried that I can't go to the dentist because I don't have insurance. And uh, so I wanted a, a web page, you know, on my website that was optimized just for that. So that's, and that's uh, another thing uh, that I, that I advocate is most uh, dental websites, let's face it, when a dentist writes the check uh, for uh, creating a website to one of these companies, you know, they're going, I mean, obviously they're going to look at the price, the cost of, of creating the website. And so these website companies are competing with each other to get the business of dentists who are looking at the bottom line. And so there's only so much they can do for so much money. And so what they tend to do is they tend to put everything on one page. For example, they have a services page and they've got every service that you offer, whether it's crowns and bridges and root canals uh, and braces and implants, it's all on one page and that dilutes the search engine optimization. Uh, I recommend having a separate page for every service that you offer. And that's going to uh, be a lot better in terms of search engine optimization because if somebody's looking for a dental implant dentist, if there's a patient out there who needs dental implants or wants dental implants, looking for a dentist who does that and they type in dental implant dentist, you know, uh, Phoenix, and your website has your dental implant information buried on a long page of, of multiple dental services, but meanwhile, Dr. Y has a full page dedicated to dental implants, nothing but dental implants on that page. Uh, that page is gonna show up higher in the Google search results. And so having your services uh, all separated into their own pages is gonna be a big advantage, but it's gonna cost you more. It's gonna cost you more. So you recommend multiple websites for the same dental office? No websites multiple pages on your website okay. so you have one website todaysdental.com and then there instead of having just a single services page you can have a services page but then from that page a, a sub menu of you know dental implants uh, you know uh, short-term orthodontics uh, you know uh, root canals filling white fillings veneers all of those individual services then have their own page within your website okay and my Mike an answer this question um, because when you and I got out of school, there really wasn't websites or internets or social media. So a lot, a lot of dentists asked us, um, do I need a website or, could, or does a Facebook page do? And so and I'm asking you, on your new patients, how many of them come out? What, what is your um, um, Palm, Palm or Boynton Springs? What, what is your pay, the dental office website? Oh, my dental office is Palm Beach Smiles. Okay, Palm Beach Smiles, but I thought you just said earlier that you moved to Boynton, though. No, no, I haven't. No, I'm in Palm Beach County. So oh, okay. that was my idea. I wanted to, to, to broaden. Well, a couple of reasons I chose Palm Beach Smiles, and this is back in 1999. I was trying to come up with a domain or a web, a web address for my practice website, and I was just brainstorming ideas, and I came up with, you know, I, I, you know, I think the best name for a domain is, you know, what do you do and where are you? If you can combine those things into your domain, that's a, a natural choice. Well, I'm in Boynton Beach, but I'm in Palm Beach County. I wanted to draw from the larger area. I just didn't want to draw from Boynton Beach. And Palm Beach, the word, you know, that, that, that name has some cachet to it. You know, uh, Palm Beach is also a town here. So, uh, very so do you also have a Facebook.com forward slash Palm Beach Dental Facebook page? Yeah, I have a Facebook page, a Palm Beach Smiles Facebook page. And right. you have a, a Palm Beach Smiles www.com. Right. So, now what what do you what do you, what's 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 really the difference? And do you get more patients from your website or your Facebook page? Far, far more from the website, and almost none from Facebook. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, go into that because everybody just keeps hearing all these buzzwords that they're going to build their dental office to success on Facebook, and you just said no. Well, you know, hey, maybe somebody has. I mean, there probably are uh, guys that have, uh, but, you know, I think social media, you know, is is something that you have to show up. I think that's, that's my, my take on social media. You can't pay somebody to be your proxy on social media. Social media is interactive, and so, you know, you can't uh, be invited to a party and send somebody else to the party on your behalf and expect the people there to have seen, you know, believe they saw you. So I think, you know, uh, uh, social media like Facebook, you really need to be there yourself or somebody in the office needs to be on that and almost on a daily basis. So I think, you know, the thing about social media like Facebook is it requires a, a, a tremendous amount of energy poured into it on a regular basis. Uh, a website is relatively static. And so uh, I think, you know, that's going to be, uh, you know, something that shows up when people are looking for, when they're Googling, I, you know, dental implant dentist or a, a smile makeover dentist in my town. Uh, I think having your own website, there's a lot more control. Uh, so but my experience with social media has been, you know, somewhat lackluster, but I will admit that I have not put that much into it. Uh, you know, there's only so much, <laughs> so much I can do and so many places I can be. Uh, I'm a hockey dad. Uh, my daughter goes to uh, horseback riding lessons. I've got a family, uh, so I've got a practice. I've got, uh, you know, I've got Dental Town that I've got to show up on. Uh, I've got a blog uh, that I try to write for. So, so your, your son's 14. How old's your daughter? Uh, she'll be 11 in two weeks. She's sitting right over here to my left. Okay, I got I got to tell you this true story. I, I live in Phoenix, right? But my neighborhood's the equestrian center because there's a, a horse riding property. And then I grew up in Kansas. And I don't know what it is about girls. Little girls want a horse. And you know what? As soon as they get their car keys, they never look at the one the horse again. So they're just <laughs> mesmerized by horses until they get yes. their first set of car keys. Then you're going to get the horse. She's going to yeah. give it to you the minute you give her the car keys. Right, right. So, so, um, so um, what do you, um, you, you also, um, I, I love some of your catchphrases because they're, uh, so, you say organized dentistry, disorganized dentistry. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not currently a big fan of, uh, of so-called organized dentistry, the American Dental Association. Uh, I was very active in it uh, years ago. I'm not a member currently. I haven't been a member for probably about 10 years. Uh, and I, you know, I kind of got disillusioned with them. I, uh, you know, the, the advice is always, you know, well, you got to get involved. So I did. I got involved. I, I went all the way up through the president of our local affiliate association. You know, I served on the board and went all the way up to president. And, you know, was the big cheerleader for it. But uh, I don't think that the ADA really represents the, uh, the typical practicing dentist anymore. I think there's some uh, conflict of interest. A lot of the uh, uh, top people in the organization, uh, you know, uh, have had uh, ties to the insurance industry. And uh, so I don't think a lot of dentists feel well represented. Uh, they seem to be, uh, in fact, even when I was on the board uh, at the local affiliate, I used to get uh, kind of chastised a bit because their mantra was, we've got to sit at the table. We've got to be at the table because if we're not at the table, you know, the lawyers and the insurance companies are going to, they're going to run the show for us. And my position was that if, if, if we don't agree with what they want us to do, we need to step away from the table because without our talent, they've got nothing. And so I'm talking about the insurance companies and, and, and you know, the political powers that want to basically give our, give our services away. Uh, you know, somebody said, and I can't find the attribution, but somebody said, no man owns the talents of another. We're the ones with the talent. And so there comes a time when it's time to step away from the table and maybe even time to turn the table over, uh, upside down, uh, and walk away. So I just think that they're really more focused on, you know, this access to care, so-called access to care issue. And it's really more about access to other people's money and, uh, and access to our talents. And so, uh, right now, the ADA and I are not on the same page, and so uh, uh, I, you know, I guess I'll leave it at that. So um, I want go back to this graduating class. Um, we, we we talked about residencies, and you you learned a lot of that. Um, but what type of mix of services you do? So you know, some people you know they 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 have a successful practice, and basically all they do is fillings and crowns. Uh, other people got into six month smiles. Some people got into uh, um, you know, placing implants and learn to bone graft and 
Um, talk, talk about that. What mix do you do and what advice would you give for uh, kids coming out? Uh, what, what should they learn? And, and the most common question the senior graduating class has is um, the American Dental Association recommends nine specialties. Um, knowing what you know now, um, do you would what would you say about a specialty? Do you wish you would have specialized? What would you say to some kid who says, Mike, should I be an endodontist or a family practicing or you know, talk about talk about specialties and what and, and right. if they're not gonna specialize, what mix of services they should learn? Right. Uh, I no, I don't regret being a general dentist. I think one of the great things about being a general dentist is that we can do whatever we want. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the beauty of it. Uh, we can, we can do endo if we want, or we can not do endo if we don't want to and refer all of it out. Uh, as a general dentist, you can pick and choose and, and furthermore, you can change your mind. You know, uh, you may start out loving endo and then one day, you know, you reach 50 something years old and you're like, I don't want to do molar endo retreats anymore. And you send them out. And so I think that's the cool thing about being a general dentist is we're not pigeonholed into any one thing. And then nowadays, there are so many different types of services we can offer from, like you said, short-term orthodontics, like six-month smiles, uh, to sleep apnea treatments, to, you know, uh, uh, facial rejuvenation, Botox, and, uh, you know, uh, injectable fillers. Uh, there's, uh, you know, endo. It's mechanized endo now. You've got apex locators and rotary endo. Uh, there's so many different things you can do. Uh, and, you know, I think the key to that is to, uh, is to, you know, take as much CE as you can, learn as much as you can. You know, they'll say your dental diploma is your license to learn. And uh, you and I both have probably been through, uh, between the two of us, probably 5,000 hours of continuing education. I think I'm past 2,000 hours. But uh, that's what I love about it. And so, you know, uh, you know specializing you know it, it, if that's what you want to do that's great uh, I, but I don't regret it personally and what do I offer I don't place implants uh, I don't do that yet I do restore implants and I love restoring implants uh, I do most of my own endo I do uh, most of my own extractions but nothing uh, you know I don't do any 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 uh, more complex surgeries I do refer out to the oral surgeon or if it's a patient management issue or a medical issue I'll refer to the oral surgeon I do, uh, I, what I have gotten into mostly is the cosmetics and also, you know, more uh, the rehab type dentistry, full mouth reconstructions, uh, full arch reconstructions, things like that. That's what I really enjoy doing. But is that because you're in Southern Florida where the average patient is 106 years old? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean what, 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 for someone around the world, what, what is your demographic area like? I mean, I mean, I, in, all, in all seriousness, uh, I think the brand of, uh, of uh, your area in Florida is the retirement home for everyone over 80 in New York and New Jersey. Is, right, that, a call, is that a, yeah, this is God's waiting room. <laughs> so, so, so is a lot of your mix of dentistry. I mean, do you have a lot of retirement people? Uh, yeah, I have a fair share. You know, I that think area? Uh, yeah, but I also have, uh, you know, I would say I'm a baby boomer practice. That's what, you know, even though, uh, we have a lot of retirees and, uh, uh, you know, geriatric patients here, uh, most of my patients are, you know, probably uh, the fat part of the bell curve from my own practice is probably 50s and 60s, uh, 40s, 40s to 60s, I guess, would be the fat part of the bell curve for me. Uh, I think you tend to attract what you want to attract. Uh, and, and supposedly, you know, your patients age with you as you get older as a dentist. I've heard that too. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, I don't have a practice full of super wealthy Palm Beachers. I, I get that reputation on dental town, <laughs> not because of what I've said, but that's, that's what people believe. Uh, my patients are working class people, the vast majority of them, uh, and some of them save their money enough to, to have, you know, significant dentistry done. But in this economy, since, you know, 2008, that dropped off quite a bit. I don't do nearly as much cosmetic stuff as I used to or full mouth rehabs as I used to. Uh, they're still there, I still do some. Uh, but you know, most of my days are garden variety dentistry, single tooth dentistry like most dentists. Um, so I think you know, a, a, new, a, new, uh, a new graduate just needs to uh, diversify as much as possible, but don't get too scattered. Uh, you know, learn something well and then move on to the next thing. It's kind of like when you buy you, your first computer and you buy every software available and now you've got a stack of 20 different softwares and you're overwhelmed, so you don't want to overwhelm yourself. And uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I think it was imp it's important to bring it back up. We talked about keeping your debt load low, 
But there's also this temptation, especially with social media, like Dental Town, and Dental Town is dental social media, is, you know, there's, there's a, a, it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, the Joneses and keeping up with the Joneses and getting the, the CAD cam and the comb beam. I mean, you could spend a quarter million dollars just on those two things. And I think it's easy to get caught up in that excitement. And next thing you know, you've got a big nut to cover and that machine's sitting in the corner or you're trying to find ways to use it. And so I think that, you know, there are a lot of exciting technologies available, but, you know, baby steps, especially when you're out of, when you're fresh out of school, baby steps, don't get, don't get uh, socked down with a whole bunch of debt so you can have all the latest toys. Um, but, but talk about, talk about the two big toys. Cause if you walk out of school two fifty. And you buy in the CAD CAM, that's another 150, and a 3D X-ray machine is another 150. You, you've you've doubled your student loan debt, and you bought two things and a gift bag. And you're right, and you don't even have a practice yet. <laughs> so, so what's your what? So, so my do do you have? Are you CAD CAM? Are nope. you CVCT? Nope, <laughs> nope, I, I'm not. And uh, you know, at some point, I might consider the scanning side of the CAD CAM equation. You know, instead of uh, in, you know traditional impressions, which I still do. Uh, you know, I might consider that, and the price has come down on that to a degree. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, to me, I've got to look at the ROI. I'm a solo practice too. And I think that may, that, that weighs into the equation too. If you got a practice with six dentists, one CAD CAM machine is going to get used a lot more than it's going to get used in a single, uh, you know, solo practice. Uh, so that's a factor too. But, uh, you know, so I'm speaking as a solo practitioner and, uh, you know, to me, CAD CAM does not make sense for me. And, you know, there could be a huge debate. And, but, and what, but, but forget about all the other people because I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to yeah. Mike, the man bar, the dental warrior. Why did CAD come I mean, laughing at you. What's that? My daughter's laughing at you every time you call me the man. Well, you are the man. You, you absolutely are the man. I, and I, I mean that. I mean, you, you've been. In fact, you know what I was thinking when I saw you today? Seriously, that I don't want to creep you out, but I think you were the first dentist I met online. I think it was a Yahoo email, a Yahoo group. I think it was like 98 or 97. Yeah, well, you, you had a Yahoo group, didn't you? It was, no, it was, um, it was. Uh, CompuServe. It was, uh, yeah, CompuServe. Yeah, there was a CompuServe group I was a member of, and then there was also a group called Generation Next, which was uh, kind of like a Yahoo group. With, with Mike Maroon. Yeah. But you were you were before that. I think the first yeah. name I ever saw on the internet who was a dentist was your name, and I think it was CompuServe. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, these I young kids. Al Gore. I, I co-invented it with Al Gore. <laughs> but but um but you're a smart man you're a businessman um why did and and, and the pro CAD CAM people drowned uh, the message that you know you just, you just got to have it but right. we're, we're talking to you why why did that message why did they not get you why why did you why did you resist that hundred and fifty thousand dollar toy because I'm a I'm stubborn and I'm a nonconformist <laughs> but uh, I you know I just looked at it hundred fifty thousand dollars and. You know, I would get into some, some debates with some of the CAD CAM advocates, and I said, look, you know, I just can't see $150,000, uh, you know, so that I can make a crown on the same day. And one of their arguments was, don't think of it as $150,000. Think of it as a $2,500 a month payment, which you're spending on your lab bill anyways. And that was their argument. And I said, but here's the difference. If I don't like my lab, I can fire my lab. I can get rid of my lab. I can move to a, on to another lab. Uh, if, if I don't like the $150,000 machine, the company that made it is not taking it back. I can't get rid of it. It's still sitting in the corner, and I've got to keep using it. Or not, and I've got to keep paying for it. If I don't, you know, whether I use it or not, I've got to keep paying for it. So I can't fire the CAD CAM machine if I decide I don't like it. Yeah, I can turn around and sell it on eBay, probably for a tremendous loss. Uh, so... I just, you know, I just don't see the return on investment. That's just me. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm a low volume practice, relatively speaking, and I'm a solo practice. So if I'm going to drop, you know, six figures on a gizmo, uh, you know, it's got to pay. And uh, so that just basically kind of scared the crap out of me. And, uh, you know, it was a solution to a problem I don't have. I learned that phrase from another dentist on CompuServe way back in the day. There are a lot of solutions out there to problems I don't have, and I don't have a problem with my patients having a temporary. Uh, I have never had a patient say to me, you know, I would get that crown if I didn't have to have a temporary. Um, 
my temporaries don't fall off. It's extremely rare, so that's not a problem. Uh, the goopy impressions, yeah, they don't like it, but, you know, it, it's just I've never had a patient refuse to have a crown because of the goopy impression. Well, so try try this on. Well, try this on for size. I mean, okay. um, I am. Um, I, I, I tell the patient, okay, you know, we can make this a one appointment, but it's going to be two hours. Um, right. we, can, um, we can just have your appointment day for an hour, and then you leave the temporary, then come back in two weeks uh, for just a little 30-minute uh, seat, and right. the majority choose that. And really? I, don't know, I don't know if I'm AD, because I, I got to move. I don't know if I'm ADD or too hype or whatever, but, Mike, if you told me I had to oh. sit in a dental chair for two or two and a half hours, I'd go right. crazy. Right. I mean, yeah, ima I, imagine, imagine going to your next doctor's appointment and it's two hours. Yeah. Well, that's just in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, you, uh, you, you can speak from a position of having to offer both and they're choosing the old fashioned way. That's really interesting. I think that patients tend to believe what you believe. Uh, I learned yeah. that from another dentist. Uh, they say, you know what, you got a, uh, a dentist right next door to me. And uh, he told me, I actually started my practice by leasing space in his office. And he said, he said Mike, you've got to choose your religion. If you believe in implants, your patients will believe in implants. Because a lot of dentists say they can't get their patients to do implants. It's just because that's, they don't believe in it. So I think if you believe in something, your patients pick up on that enthusiasm. And they're going to believe it too. So I think it's uh, a big part of it is confidence in whatever that you're doing. Um, so, uh, but anyways, uh, bottom line was I just didn't think I, I could justify 150 grand for a solution to a problem I just didn't think I have. Uh, oh, you know, there oh, are a lot of guys that oh, make it work. I want to ask you another question. I want to go a different way. Um, you, I graduated one year before you. 80, I graduated in 87. You were 88. Um, right. you're, down, you're down there with a lot of retired people. So am I in Phoenix. I mean, in, in my area, 20% uh, of, of the Phoenix area pretty much retired after 65 most of them, it's it's a ten percent California, ten percent Canada, and then the rest is pretty much um, west of the Mississippi in the northern states, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, North South Dakota, all that stuff. If they're east of the Mississippi River, they go to where you're at, Florida. And if they're west of the Mississippi, they go here. But you know what, um, man, I'm a I, I I've seen so many of these root canals and crowns I did on these lovely ladies when they were in their 50s and 60s, and then when they um, get into a nursing home or they get dementia or they get Alzheimer's, root service decay, just wow. They they I I, I the the number I'm keep seeing mostly is they're losing about a tooth for every month they're in the nursing home from root service decay. So when grandma's been in the nursing home 15 months, she's lost 15 teeth from root service decay, and then. <laughs> then I see in the nursing home those ladies that got an implant in a crown instead of a root canal built in crown. Um, and to me, from Kansas, it just makes sense that it seems like I used to always build a wooden barn and say, Mike, you got to brush and floss twice a day, and you got to brush, 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 and the termites eventually to get the whole barn anyway. And now I'm looking back at those barns that I went out and built with uh, aluminum. And you don't have to brush it and floss it, and the termites can come, and they're not going to eat it. Do you think, um, when you and I graduated from school, some called it the golden era. Do you think this is the titanium era? And and do you think um, titanium is going to be a game changer just because uh, we're not really engineers, we're biologists, and bugs can't eat titanium? Is this a game changer, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Because you, you've been in this field 30 years. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think it has changed. You know, we were taught to basically save, you know, if at all possible, we'd save a tooth, not only with the root canal post and our crown, but we'd do crown lengthening on it, ortho extrusion. You know, we, we'd go to the ends of the earth to save a tooth. And, uh, you know, implants back then were, they were around, but they were kind of voodoo. And uh, so, I mean, I got zero experience with implants in dental school, zero. Uh, I never saw my first implant until I, probably after the Navy. Um so, but I think it has been a game changer because, you know, by the time you do a root canal post and crown lengthening in a crown on a tooth, you know, you could be into that tooth for five grand uh, in some places uh, or three grand or whatever. But, you know, whereas an implant is more predictable and, and, and probably more economical in some cases uh, in the short term and certainly more economical in the long term. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm not as prone to doing uh, herodonics. Uh, on natural teeth unless that's you know the patient really insists on it uh, implants are very uh, very predictable now and they don't decay 
uh, as you said. Now, they can certainly have uh, uh, periodontal issues, uh, but, uh, but they're not prone to root decay, and I see that too. I, I, you know, I'm definitely seeing you know, follow-ups of, of teeth that we you know, went to great, uh, 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 great efforts to save, and then the gingiva recedes, and then there's root caries, and you know, all the way around circumferentially, and it's very difficult to deal with. And, uh, and then by the time, like you said, they're that old or, or frail or in the nursing home, um, you know, it's, it's, it's too late to really do anything. So I, I think that's an interesting point. Uh, I know that dental students nowadays, I think, are getting a lot more exposure to implants. And the implant systems are, are so easy. I, I'm telling you, restoring dental implants is probably the easiest thing I do. I, I don't like to say this very often because I don't want to feel, um, uh, I don't want to offend the younger kids, but it was a lot harder to be a good dentist 30 years ago. I mean, you didn't have apex locators. You didn't have digital x-rays. The assistant would take a film x-ray, take it 10 minutes to develop it, and if she cone cut it and you're running behind and you, and you had to retake it, you're um, implants. Short. <laughs> What's that? And then you're two millimeters short. Yeah, and then and you then, got to start over. And, and then on um, implants, I mean, we had 2D panos and you would lay back the tissue thing. You had an inch of bone and it turned out to be some knife edge. And by the time you smooth it down, there wasn't any left. I mean, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I really think it's a lot easier uh, to be a dentist um, now um, yeah. than, it, than it was back then. I mean, I it mean, had to be. I mean, farming had to be easier when they got a tractor and you could get rid of the cow and plow. Right, right. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think we both, you know, walked uphill both ways through three feet of snow to get to, get to dental school. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, the technology has changed. You know, I love my Apex locator, uh, uh, you know, and uh, rotary endo, rotary files uh, are fantastic. Uh, so that makes root canals do you know, a lot. Do you know before rotary endo, first the first six years out of school, I always had a blister on the end of my finger and on my thumb from holding onto those files? I mean, it was, like a, it was like a guitar player has the blisters on their finger. I had yeah. two blisters yeah. for, for, for a decade. Yeah, hey, yeah. I, I, I want, I want to, I, I've only got you for three more minutes, so I, I want to ask something that's uh, very, very rare and unique about you other than all the dentists out there. That is um, most townies. We're, we're coming up on 200,000. We're, we're at like 198,200, and we're just almost at 4 million posts. And so many of those people I meet, I say, well, why don't you ask that on Dental Town? Oh, I'm afraid. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope someone else posts it. And I get emails all the time. I mean, literally every single day. You know, will you ask this question? I'm yeah. like, dude, you ask the question. Why, why? So, so my, my question is to you, why does someone like you just absolutely not give a shit what anyone thinks and posted 30,000 times and, and you, I mean, and you're, you're not going to budge on the NRA. You're not going to give away your gun. you how come, how come a dentist like you is just going to, this is me like it. This is Mike Barr, the man unedited raw, take it, leave it, fly a kite. Why do you not care? And 99% uh, of dentists just have burning questions and they just can't post it. And what advice would you give to someone who really wants to ask a question but is afraid someone's going to say, boo, and they'll run um, all the way? My instinct is to tell them to, to, you know, to grow a pair. Uh, but, uh, you, know, uh, I, you know, this is true even before, uh, you know, um, before the uh, social media like Dental Town where, you know, we could all do this online. I would go to, you know, CE courses, and it's always the same dentist asking questions in the audience, you know, and everybody else is shutting up. I think dentists, uh, as a group, are are relatively shy, and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and they they're afraid of what their colleagues will think. And I think that probably goes back to dental school. I mean, I, there's no love lost between me and the University of Tennessee College of Dentistry. Uh, one of my <laughs> classmates, one of my classmates said I wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. Uh, Was that and, Memphis? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I mean, I'll put it this way: when I went into the military. It was like going to summer camp for grown-ups compared to dental school. Dental school, we got treated pretty tough. And so we're beat down quite a bit in dental school. And I think that carries throughout our entire career. We're shy. We're afraid to say anything because we're going to be, you know, uh, struck by, you know, dental lightning uh, from our colleagues. And I think so dentists are really pretty shy. And, uh, you know, they're afraid of what other dentists are going to think. Uh, you know, why do I not give a shit? I think part of it is age. <laughs> One of the, it's very liberating to not give a crap. It really is. Um, and, 
you know, so I've got some experience behind me, you know, so uh, it's not cocky if you can back it up. Uh, you know, and then I've got you as an example. I mean, you don't give a shit either. Uh, I saw you, I think it was around 1992 or 93, you lectured here in West Palm Beach, and you got up on the stage there, and I didn't know you, and uh, you... Uh, you went at it like, you know, you're like the Dennis Miller of dentistry. <laughs> you go off on tangents, you do all kinds of references, and it's just, if you can't fall asleep during either Dennis Miller or Howard Ferran, you cannot fall asleep. So, you know, I, I, I like that about you. And so I think, uh, you know, even, you know be, be yourself and don't, don't worry about what other people are going to think. Uh, I guarantee you, you know, that there, if you ask a question on Dental Town, there's always going to be some, you know, uh, you know, keyboard commando tough guy who's going to give you crap. But there's a there's a lot of really good people on Dental Town. Tons of good people. The majority of them are good people. And so don't let the turkeys get you down. They're, they're going to be there, and 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 it's easy for them because they're anonymous behind the keyboard, and it's easy to be a tough guy behind the keyboard. Uh, but you know, uh, if you have a question, I guarantee you, there's tons of us that have either had the same questions dealt with the same questions, had the same problems. You know, I call Dental Town. It's a collective intelligence that I have access to 24-7. I can ask anything on Dental Town, and somebody out there will know it. In fact, a lot of people will have the answers. And so it's a collective intelligence that we can all tap into. And to not tap into it, to me, is just a, a tremendous loss. Uh, Dental Town and, and the other social media that I've been a, a member of, uh, dentally speaking, uh, are a big part of what I do today. Uh, everything I do today, you know, uh, is affected in some way by what I've learned online from my, my online colleagues. And we're out of time. We are in one minute overtime. So right. um, how do these, um, when, when is your, the complete website owner's manual for dentists, second edition coming soon? How, how does uh, someone on this podcast uh, get on the waiting list for that? How, how do they uh, let you know? list, but I, I probably could. I, it's, it's, I'm, a, I'm a terrible procrastinator. I'm, I'm juggling a, a lot of uh, things at one time, uh, so I don't have a time frame, but I'm on the downhill side of getting it ready to go. I'm looking into making it a downloadable product instead of a paper book. Uh, you know, uh, they can contact me uh, at, uh, you know, I guess they can email me at mike at the dentalwarrior.com. That's the easy one. Or they can do mike at revupmymarketing.com. Um, and uh, or Mike at um, Palm, at Palm, Palm Beach, Beach. Beach Smiles. Yeah, dot com. And so, uh, yeah, I'm working on it here and there, and I'll get it out eventually. Uh, but, uh, and I'm thinking about doing a downloadable product instead of a paper product, uh, or maybe both. Uh, if they want to give me some feedback on that. And, uh, la and last question you went, you went to the University of Tennessee in Memphis, and B.B. King just passed away. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. did you did you I did you ever get to see him on Bill Street? I never no I never saw him myself in person live, but uh, you know I saw a lot of his influence there, and uh, yeah he he was a cool guy. Would you say Bill Street is the number one jazz street in America, or would you say that's more Bourbon Street or Nashville? Oh gosh, I don't know. I haven't been to Bourbon Street, uh, so I'm pr I'm partial to Memphis, of course, and uh, also the best barbecue. I I think it's utterly amazing. I mean, America it, that Mississippi Delta is amazing because. The, the bands on New Orleans uh, Bourbon Street and Memphis Bill Street and Nashville, <clears throat> I forgot the name of that street, but it's about eight blocks long. And just, I mean, just every block, there's a couple of bands just crushing it. But, I mean, America is just vast in music. And a lot of people think music is like L.A. or Detroit or Motown, which is all true. Right. But the hidden ones are Bill Street, Nashville, and New Orleans. I mean, everybody knows Motown and Detroit and la and hollywood but I, I just i just love bill street but hey we are three minutes over time i got to go mike seriously man i love you like a brother thank you you're i think you're the first dentist i ever met online on CompuServe. um i'm a huge fan of your thirty-two thousand posts i'm a huge fan of your rev up my marketing and your all your other stuff. just thank you so much for all that you've done for me personally for dental town and for dentists around the world on the internet you're just the bomb dude well you are too thanks for creating dental town because believe me i all the stuff that I've done wouldn't have been possible without Dental Town. Well, no one, no one would have ever gone to Dental Town if it wasn't for guys like you on there. Yeah, blabbermouth. <laughs> all right. Thank you for all you do, Mike. See you later. And tell your all son right. happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Okay, bye.